And we continue at 2.06 in the afternoon. Talk Radio 790 KABC, the John Phillips Show, broadcasting live from the Morongo Casino Resort and Spa Living Room Studios. Mr. Randy Wang's at the sports desk in Culver City. John, I'm working on posting the podcast right now of last hour where we played you the sound of George Gascon explaining why he didn't think L.A. County needed grant money to fight retail crime from the state. We have been doing that already, and the determination was made, and quite frankly, very quickly, that we did not apply. That and all the other explosive things in that interview with Mark Brown you can hear in moments when I post it. Share that one with your friends. That is some wild Gascon sound that only we seem to know about. Now, George Gascon did this interview with Mark Brown on their public affairs program that's buried at 7 a.m. on the weekend, correct? That's how big of a nerd I am. I knew that. Okay, so this means that not very many people saw this interview and heard the outrageous things that George Gascon said. That's right. This is the first time a lot of people are hearing this, but Mark Brown did an incredible interview and we wanted to give it justice and give it honor, but share this out there because I don't, I haven't heard any other outlet have George Gascon explain why he turned down money from the state. And here's the hidden secret behind these public affairs shows. As part of maintaining your FCC license, radio and television stations are required to do a certain amount of public affairs programming. Typically, the stars of the network don't want to do the public affairs show because the public affairs show gets buried at some time when no one's usually listening. For whatever reason, at ABC7, they gave that job to a pro in Mark Brown. And every time Mark Brown hosts this public affairs show, there is good stuff that comes from it, but very few people are aware of it because the show is buried. But Randy keeps an eye on all of that. I pay attention to way too much stuff in local news, but that's one of the things I look for every Monday morning is there are brand new eyewitness newsmakers and is there some hot sound and that was one of the best ones we've ever got. The podcast is now up, so go to kabc.com, click on podcast, go to the Apple Podcasts app, iHeart, Spotify, search for The John Phillips Show, hit subscribe, and you can download it and share it with your friends and post it on social media. George Gascon explains why he turned down money from the state to fight retail crime. All right, now it's time to open up the KABC Crime Blotter. If the cashier is dummy. Questions! And Randy, I'm a man of my word. Today's edition takes us to Oakland. That's right. A man who is getting his life on the up and up puts a whole bunch of expensive camera equipment in a rental car that gets broken into. Where? (laughs) The city of Oakland. For more, we have a report from KGO. The place. If this is the place where stolen goods from in and around the Bay Area come, that's kind of messed up. He's one of more than 10,000 people whose car has been broken into so far this year in Oakland. But his story doesn't end with the shattered glass you see there on Broadway. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dan Ashley. I'm Larry Beal. That man, he had attached trackers to $24,000 worth of camera gear that was stolen that day. But what happened next was very frustrating, mm. not only for him, but for all of us who really care about public safety as well as quality of life here. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, Ag Team reporter Dan Noyes is here to pick up the story, Dan. Well, Larry and Dan, through an app on his phone, he watches his gear go across the bridge into San Francisco to what an officer called a known fencing operation. If it's a known fencing operation, why haven't they shut it down? (laughs) That's a very good question. They know where everyone is taking the stolen goods. They know where they're selling them. They know where they're fencing them, to use that fancy term. And they just let it operate? the only business left in downtown San Francisco. This couldn't have come at a worse time for Justin Shuck. He was rebuilding his life after losing everything, including his successful advertising agency, because of a substance abuse issue. Four y- Probably cocaine. If he were on math, he'd be the one stealing the equipment. Ad guy in the Bay Area, that's coke. 
Four years of clean living later, he bought camera gear, enrolled in the master's film program at SF State, and started taking video production jobs, including one in Oakland two weeks ago. I had just been driving through downtown, and I was like, isn't Oakland beautiful? Like, I love Oakland. Wait, he's clean? How screwed up is this? This guy's life fell apart. He's putting the pieces back together. He's attending graduate school. He's back at work. He's doing a job. And it's the out-of-control crime that's going to knock this guy off the wagon. I had just been driving through downtown, and I was like, isn't Oakland beautiful? Like, I love Oakland. Justin thought he had done enough to hide the gear in the trunk of his rented Tesla while he had lunch on Broadway, just across from the YMCA. But he came out to find this. Windows shattered, his camera, lenses, and drone gone. Justin had just bought the gear and hadn't had time to insure it. Oh, boy. He is out of luck. I, like, literally felt like the pit of my stomach drop. I knew that the equipment wasn't... I hope this guy has a solid sponsor, because he's going to be calling him a lot. I knew that the equipment wasn't insured. And so to have it gone so soon after, like, buying it... Uh, it just was devastating. Usually in these cases, it's smash, grab, and gone. You have little chance of retrieving your property. But Justin had hidden tracking devices inside his gear cases. And on a phone app, he watched the criminals travel from Oakland into San Francisco. Okay, isn't that a little weird? He didn't think to not keep the stuff in his car in a place where cars get broken into all the time. He didn't insure the gear... But he did put a tracking device on it because he knew it was going to get stolen. Okay, what's the point of the tracking device, though, when you know the cops won't go looking for it? You know, it was on Post Street, right? And it's literally moving. He's on the phone with a San Francisco police officer when he sees his camera gear arrive at this location in the 300 block of Leavenworth. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's a known major fencing operation. <laughs> <laughs> We know about it. We just won't do anything about it. Everybody in the Bay Area knows that they can bring their stolen goods and offload them there. Think about that. But that's what he said? That is what the officer said to me on the phone. Justin used to live in the area, and he knows it well. And it's a block and a half, not even a block and a half, from the Tenderloin police station. <laughs> This is when things get to a level where literally nobody cares. How are you not raiding that place on a daily basis? I had the same question. So I walked by the location of the alleged fencing operation to the Tenderloin police station and called its captain, Sergio Chin. He did not return my messages. I reached an SFPD spokesperson who would not comment on the Leavenworth site, but emailed, at this time, we cannot disclose any information on the location you referred to based on possible ongoing investigations. How much evidence do you need? Raid the place. They told the guy on the phone that they knew what it was and they knew what happened there. I also checked with the supervisor for this district, Dean Preston, not only about the possible fencing operation. And you remember Dean Preston, he's the one that tried to white splain racist drug policies to London Breed. That's right. He is essentially a clone of George Gascon that's on the board of supervisors up there. And in theory, because the crime is going on in his district, he's the one that needs to scream and yell about it so the cops do something. But also about this mess that has taken over part of the street and sidewalk. He said he didn't have time for an interview, but texted, Our office has repeatedly engaged departments about the various challenges on the 300 block of Leavenworth, and our understanding is that this block is part of a joint field operation that includes various departments and the SFPD. The city has made no... So at this point, ABC7 Eyewitness News, KGO in the Bay Area, is better at investigating crime than the San Francisco Police Department, the San Francisco County Sheriffs, the CHP, and the National Guard. But this answer, the answer that KGO is getting here, it's like when PG&E starts a fire or a homeless encampment starts a fire. They don't want to acknowledge that they failed to require PG&E or Southern California Edison to maintain their equipment because that would be a failure of the PUC. That would be a failure of the state. 
So they blame it on what? Climate change. Whenever there's a fire that started from one of the homeless encampments, they never say, you know, we've known about this encampment for years and we probably should have broken it up a long time ago. This one's on us. No, they never say that. They blame it on climate change. Whenever you have something going on that's an illegal operation that everyone knows about and you don't want to comment on it because you know you're going to look real bad on the news, you say, I can't comment. There's an ongoing investigation. The city has made no noticeable progress. Just yesterday, Preston chaired a committee about the car break-ins and updated an anti-fencing reward program set up by Mayor Breed two years ago. It offers up to $100,000 for information leading to an arrest of those dealing in stolen goods. Preston said no money ever has been paid out as part of the rewards program. (laughs) Um, But it's also, I think, important to circle back and look at what's working, what isn't. Frustrating times for Justin Shuck, someone who lived in Oakland and now calls San Francisco home. I mean, I honestly think it's time for new leadership at like every level because this has gone on long enough and I'm sick and tired. I'm sick and tired. And John, he's not the only one that thinks that. There are quite a few people that are upset with leadership at every level, including San Francisco supervisor of the Tenderloin, Mr. Dean Preston, who put out a release over the weekend saying what we need to do to deal with car break-ins is a public awareness campaign that tells people not to put valuables in their car. You know what this is? This is anti-crime policies brought to you by the people who brought you endless mask mandates. We know those blue masks that they required us to wear do not work. This has been proven time and time again. But it's virtue signaling. By wearing those masks that we know do not prevent respiratory viruses from spreading, you're telling the rest of the world that you're a good person. It doesn't matter if what you're doing is stopping the spread of a disease. It's something that they require because they want everyone to have to prove that they are, in fact, a good person. They don't want to take the steps that are needed to be taken to actually stop crime, like, oh, I don't know, going in and busting up this illegal operation. So what do they want? They want slacktivism. They want virtue signaling. They want to make it seem like they're doing something about it, but not actually having to do anything about it. Well, and news of that meeting that Dean Preston held where he said that exact thing, that we just need to have more awareness about keeping the valuables out of your car than dealing with the car break-ins. Well, that's not going to go very well for him in an election year where he's running for re-election because that clip pissed someone all the way off to the point of Elon Musk donating $100,000 to his opponent. Good for him. For more on that, let's go back to KGO. New at 11, Elon Musk has pledged to donate $100,000 to defeat one progressive San Francisco supervisor during next year's election. It comes after the supervisor received some pushback for comments he made about the city's problem with car break-ins. But as ABC7 News reporter Tim Johns explains, there's a lot more to this story. A post from San Francisco Supervisor Dean Preston now going viral online. On Wednesday, Preston taking to the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, to urge the city to launch a campaign telling visitors not to leave things in their cars. The supervisor saying the move would dramatically reduce car (laughs) break-ins. Idiot. The tweet getting noticed by several... How did that work in L.A. with the Stash It, Don't Flash It campaign? Oh, yeah. When they don't want you to keep loose change in your car or bottles because bums might break in to recycle the plastic bottle. The tweet getting noticed by several of Preston's political opponents, including Elon Musk, who said he'd donate $100,000 to help defeat him in the next election. And that's not instead of enforcement, right? The police department and the DA will work on the enforcement side of it. During an interview, Preston said his tweet was taken out of context by Musk and others. He tells me he believes... This guy even sounds like someone who's a total load. The city needs a multi- For the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, he's so nuts he makes the rest of them look sane. 
hopes the city needs a multifaceted approach to tackle the car break-in epidemic. That's why he hosted a special hearing Thursday, bringing together several city agencies to try and find solutions to the problem. Let's actually have real signage with graphics that are clear to people no matter what language they speak. That's what's going to do it. You have little infographics of a purse and a laptop with a circle that's got a cross over it. Don't put that in your car. How does someone like this ever get elected to anything? You could ask that about so many people that are currently employed by the state of California. (laughs) For heaven's sakes. Let's actually have real signage with graphics that are clear to people no matter what language they speak. Let's have community ambassadors. (laughs) Oh, for the love (laughs) of God. Let's have community ambassadors who are out there handing a similar flyer to people as they park. That's what we need, the ambassadors who are busy getting stabbed. With the one hand they have covering their wound, the other hand they will be passing out flyers telling you, do not keep valuables in your car because your car will get broken into. Just in case there are any electeds listening to this broadcast today, whenever you go on television or the radio or in front of a public audience, and you talk about the need for safety ambassadors, just so you know, you come off sounding exactly like him. San Francisco has averaged between 15 and 20,000 car break-ins a year since around 2017, a fact that perpetuates negative perceptions of the city for both locals and visitors alike, says Sharky Liguana. When visitors... Wait, that is the greatest name I've ever heard. Sharky Iguana? Sharky Liguana. And visitors alike, says Sharky Liguana. When visitors come here and... Uh, Their windows are broken and their uh, luggage is stolen, their passports are stolen, their computers are stolen. Uh, It doesn't make them want to come back. Laguana is the president of the American Car Rental Association. Wait, the guy that runs the Car Rental Association is named Shark? That's fitting. Well, didn't they have OJ as their spokesman at one time? Laguana is the president of the American Car Rental Association. He says leaving your car empty doesn't always help. But it's certainly no guarantee. I've had my car broken into many times, and it didn't have anything in it. Laguana says San Francisco has been trying the same failed methods to prevent car break-ins for years, and that city leaders need to find new solutions. And this is where we're coming up short. Uh, We're just unable to uh, catch these people uh, doing it. In San Francisco, Tim Johns, ABC7 News. All right, everyone, listen to Sharky. Sharky wants them to put some teeth into it. (laughs) There's no way, right, that Dean Preston can win re-election when his platform is we need community ambassadors to hand out flyers and that's going to stop car break-ins? Wait, he represents the Tenderloin, though. Yes. His, his constituents are all on meth. Well, there is that. Maybe if you're on meth, what he's saying makes sense. <laughs> Elon, you might need to give a little more than 100 k you make that in a half a sec. If you want to email the show, you can do so at Johnny Don't Like Show at gmail.com. That's Johnny Don't Like Show at gmail.com. And Randy, if you want to go back and listen to that explosive last hour with all the outrageous things that George Gascon had to say to Mark Brown, that's easy to do and it's up and loaded. That's right. Go to KABC.com, click on podcasts, go to the Apple Podcast app, iHeart, Spotify, YouTube, search for the John Phillips Show, hit subscribe. You could download all of the episodes, including the one o'clock hour where George Gascon explains why he turned down money from the state to fight retail crime and why George Gascon explains that all the people arrested so far in this task force got out on no bail i just read something that blew my mind randy what's that in the week since the passing of jimmy buffett who of course whose music we play every friday on this program he is associated with that margarita lifestyle correct oh yeah wasted away again in margaritaville okay according to usa today he didn't even drink margaritas yeah that makes sense that song's about cocaine Here is what he said, quote, margaritas have gotten very sweet. I like real lime juice. I don't like a lot of sugar. Buffett said he prefers tequila on the rocks with a little lime since it has less sugar and is basically a more refined take on the drink that made him famous. 
I love that. I, that's how. Uh, by the way, that's how I order a margarita. No agave, no sugar, just tequila and lime juice. So Jimmy Buffett and I agree on that one. Apparently you two are on the same page. All right. Coming up next, we're going to go live to the southern border and speak with someone who lives literally on the border to find out if what's going on down there is as chaotic as the news is presenting it. Well, if you've been watching cable news today or any time over the weekend, you have seen the chaos that's going on at the southern border. According to the Border Patrol, sources told Fox News there were approximately 11,000 migrant encounters at the southwestern border over the last 24 hours, marking, quote, the single highest day in recent memory, end quote. In Eagle Pass alone, there were more than 4,000 migrants from Friday through Sunday over the weekend. That stat provided by Fox News. Joining us to talk about this is a cattle rancher from Tombstone, Arizona, who we originally met in Washington, D.C. when we broadcasted from the nation's capital last year, Peggy Davis. Peggy, welcome. Hey, how are you, John? I appreciate your call. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We always enjoy talking to you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. These numbers that Fox News is reporting are pretty eye-popping. 11,000 encounters over the last 24 hours and 4,000 alone at Eagle Pass over the weekend. Yes, John, it's an incredible amount. And, And I think you can probably be safe in assuming that that's a conservative figure. You are in Arizona. It seems yeah. like right now, well, back in the 1990s, a lot of the illegal border crossings were happening here in California. But after we built our wall near San Diego, it yeah. shifted to Arizona and Texas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they haven't done anything to stop the hemorrhaging. No, they haven't. In fact, in uh, 2000, anywhere from uh, 1986 through the mid 2000s, we were completely overrun here. Uh, this seemed to be where where the hole was in the dike, if you will. And so um, I met with Border Patrol agents uh, here at the ranch in in 2000, and they were so proud of the fact that they'd stopped the majority of it in California, but all it did was move it over here. And um, so they. Um, came up with the grand idea of um, defense in depth, and that meant that they would um, they wouldn't put their agents on the border per se. They would put them twenty five to thirty miles inside the border and and force all those illegals that were coming across um, into instead of turning them around at the border, they just forced them into the interior, and it just kept on. And it's never worked that they still use it. What do you think whenever you see someone from the Biden administration on television and they say the border is under control, the reports of chaos at the border are right wing tropes, don't buy it. We got this covered. (laughs) Well, (laughs) they're good at lying and they don't feel bad about it. They just absolutely is a lie. And, um, you know, those those of uh, your listeners probably know it's a lie, but there's a lot out there that that believe that and and they think everything's under control when it absolutely is not. And believe me, it'll come to their front door eventually. Recently, the mayor of New York City said New York City cannot take any more illegal aliens, that they are bursting at the seams. They do not have the services to provide to them. They have run out of housing. They're having to cut their services because they're having to take care of many more people that they ever budgeted for. And they're telling them to stop coming. Yeah, isn't that a cry and shame? We've (laughs) been putting up with this for 40 years. And nobody cared that we got overrun with them, that our ranch land was basically destroyed, our fences cut down, our water tanks drained. Uh, Didn't matter to them, but New York's a sanctuary city. But now they've got too many. And cry me a river. Um, They created the problem with their liberal ideas, and so they're just going to have to live with it. What do you make of all of these locations? Because he's not the only one. 
There are other big cities. The mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass, told the governor of Texas, don't you dare send any more over here. We can't yeah. deal with it. Yet they had no problem, no problem calling individuals and government officials from border states that they were uh, motivated by racism or they were motivated by motives that were not pure. And they just needed to deal with it because they happened to sit on the border and that's their problem. That's not our problem. So stop asking us for more money. Yeah, it takes a lot of nerve to do that when they help create the problem. And they they were just ignorant of the fact that these people, it was just like a magnet drawing them here. And they've just opened the doors and let everybody in. Um, I don't know why they would expect me to take care of all of them. I, I think uh, sanctuary cities, that's what they're there for. Do Too you bad. think Do you think it could get worse? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it can get worse. And I'll tell you what my big fear is right now, not to mention the, the kinds of things that they pack in here that are, you know, very dangerous, but uh, disease. What in the world? Ellis Island used to screen people so that they didn't bring disease into this country. But now they're coming across the border with who knows what. And they didn't shut it off during COVID. So that they absolutely don't. They just don't care. They've created this by design. And um, I guess our health isn't worth it. Well, and I think the assumption for most people is that when people are coming illegally over the border, they're coming from Mexico. But that's not necessarily the case. In fact, if you look at the people who are coming here now, they're waving Venezuelan flags. Some of those flags are on display right now in parts of the southern border. They're coming from Africa. They're coming from the Caribbean. They're coming from the Middle East. They're coming from all points in between. Well, yes, everywhere, and we're, we're having an awful lot from Africa coming across through the Yuma sec- sector uh, right now. Um, and, and right here, our county is a little more, um, a little better protected than some others simply because of our sheriff here, and he's done a great job with helping all of us with that. But um, it, Still, even in our county, our friend John Ladd that lives right on the border has 10 miles of border fence, and he's got maybe one, the border patrol says one to 300 a day just coming through his area. So if you multiply that one to 300, you know, by every 10 miles along the border, you've got a lot of people coming in here. And it, it's not going to stop. Why would it? Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit hypocritical to call us racist. If we were such a racist place, why would they all want to be here? You know, I am of the belief that you can't fix this problem unless you have elements in both parties that care about border security. The Republican Party seems to be split. There are people who like the fact that cheap labor uh, is making itself available, people who, who take money from corporations, that sort of thing. Uh, Democrats look at the open border and they see potential votes. Uh, you have two Democratic U.S. senators in Arizona, or I guess one independent, uh, Kirsten Cinema and Mark Kelly. Yeah. How much do they pay attention to the border? Are they like most of the other national Democrats where they're perfectly fine with open borders, or are they more responsive? Oh, they're not very responsive at all. I think when when Cinema um, changed to the Independent Party, she's been a little little bit more on track with it. Uh, Mark Kelly doesn't give us any time of day here. Uh, my husband is on a committee that uh, does um, conference calls with with him occasionally, and he he's not doing anything to help us here. And why would why would he? We don't even have. Republicans that are willing to step up and help in a lot of cases. As you look at the images on television, you look at these facilities that are bursting at the seams, facilities that were meant for 1,000 people that sometimes are housing four times that. What do you think the Biden administration is going to do with them? (laughs) Nothing. Turn them loose to live on their own been for themselves. He has absolutely no compassion. They've been talking about how we aren't humanitarian people all of these years, but is that 
you know, a humanitarian idea to to uh, shove them all into a small group and tell them to fend for themselves. He's not going to do anything, absolutely nothing. Um, my, my, I raised on a ranch, and my dad used to tell me when I was a little girl, when I'd go help him gather cattle, he says, Honey, sometimes you're like another cow in the herd. I just have to herd you right along with them. And I think <laughs> of that a lot, and I think that's exactly what, what's happening to those people. They're just another one in the herd, and go go find I guess go find somebody to steal from or whatever they need. You know, they're desperate. Do you think every member of Congress should go to the southern border? Absolutely. I'd like to tie them each to a post down here, and I don't care which which darn party they come from. Uh, they're all the same in a lot of ways, and um, they they all need to be down here looking at the border. My husband and and uh, John Ladd invited Nancy Pelosi to come down here a few years ago, and of course she um, didn't show up. I mean, it was an actual invitation, but uh, they don't want to come here. And uh, you know, for example, Obama never came down here. Not that we really wanted him here. Um, Biden doesn't come. Uh, Kamala Harris, who's the czar, doesn't come. Um, I, you know why I think they don't want to come is because they don't want to know the truth. And they can just spew their lies all they want if they don't actually see it. I am of the belief that they don't want to go down there because the border is essentially a picture story. It's like a fire. It is like a hurricane. It is a story where people are moved by the images that they see on television, by the pictures that are taken and printed in the newspaper. And when you go to a situation like that, you don't control what's going on over your shoulder. No. We saw, we saw that happen one time with Sarah Palin when she was pardoning the Thanksgiving turkey. And she was at the turkey spot. And right over her shoulder, they were putting the turkeys in the wood chipper. And they were getting ready to send them out to the grocery store. She couldn't control the images. It was just that was what happened there. If you go to the border and you're saying everything is fine... And over your shoulder, there's 4,000 people coming across the border. You'll look like a fool. So you can't let that happen. Right. And a few years ago, John McCain was down in the Nogales area down here and uh, doing his photo op. And, you know, he he wasn't any better. He didn't help us anymore. But here were illegals crawling over the fence behind him that were on camera. That was one of those things he couldn't control. Peggy Davis, cattle rancher from Tombstone, Arizona, very close in proximity to the southern border. Thank you so much for stopping by today. We always love chatting with you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.